Welcome to part two of the Center for Freedom and Prosperity series on the Laffer Curve. I'm Dan Mitchell with the Cato Institute. Part one of this series outlined the theory behind the Laffer Curve, explaining that the tax rate has an impact on the level of taxable income and that changes in the tax rate cause a revenue feedback effect. We also explained that there is a tax rate that maximizes government revenues, but if the tax rates rise above that level, tax receipts actually fall because the economy slows down and taxable income shrinks. Now it's time to look at some of the evidence. In part one, we created an example to show how the government could collect more money with a 28% tax rate than with a 70% tax rate. But some of you may have thought that our assumption that taxable income would jump from $100 billion to $300 billion was unrealistic. A rigged example, so to speak. It's always good to be suspicious when somebody is from Washington. So let's look at the real numbers. Everyone's favorite bureaucracy, the IRS, publishes something called the Statistics of Income. If we look at their numbers for 1980 and focus on the tax returns showing taxable income above $200,000, we find nearly 117,000 rich people. These folks, the ones hit by the 70% marginal tax rate, reported more than $36 billion of taxable income that year, and the IRS grabbed more than $19 billion of that amount. So what happened in 1988 when the top tax rate had dropped to 28%? The IRS numbers are astounding. The number of rich people jumped to nearly 724,000, and they reported nearly $353 billion of taxable income above 200,000 a year. The government's slice of that pie was more than $99 billion, five times as much revenue as was collected when the tax rate was 70%. You heard me right. The rich paid five times as much tax when the tax rate was slashed. Now, before jumping to any conclusion, Let's throw in a few caveats. Not all of that additional revenue is because of a Laffer curve effect. Population grew by about 7% during that period. We also had total inflation of about 44% during those eight years. And perhaps most important, even if Reagan hadn't reduced the tax rate, there would have been some increase in the number of rich people and the amount of income they reported. So to be fair, Reagan's reduction in the top tax rate was not responsible for the rich paying five times as much it may not have even been responsible for the rich paying three times as much. But can anyone doubt that there was a huge amount of revenue feedback and that this was one of those rare cases of a tax cut paying for itself? Heck, this was the Laffer curve on steroids. Let's look at a couple of other examples. Ireland used to have a 50% corporate tax rate. That corporate tax rate in 1985 collected tax revenues equal to 1.1% of GDP. By 2004, as the chart shows, the tax rate was all the way down to 12.5%, and revenues were 3.6% of GDP. And what's really amazing is that GDP was more than three times bigger, and that's after adjusting for inflation. So Ireland's government is getting a much bigger slice of a much bigger pie, even though the tax rate is much lower. Actually, what the Laffer Curve teaches us is that the government is getting a bigger slice because the tax rate is lower. Here's another example. Russia used to have a so-called progressive tax system with a top tax rate of 30%. That wasn't too surprising. After all, Karl Marx was one of the first advocates of penalizing successful people with higher tax rates. But in a dramatic reform, Russia implemented a 13% flat tax in 2001. Did this result in less revenue? Definitely not. Receipts from personal income tax rates have skyrocketed, jumping from 175 billion rubles in 2000 to more than 930 billion rubles in 2006. The chart shows that inflation-adjusted personal income tax revenues have been growing by an average of nearly 19% annually. Now, once again, let's stop. Don't get too excited. It's time for some caveats. To help illustrate how the Laffer curve works, I've picked some extreme examples. These are a few of those rare cases where tax rate reductions result in more revenue, what might be called a strong Laffer curve effect. But as we discussed in part one, the vast majority of tax cuts don't give the government more money. Instead, the revenue feedback is more modest, meaning that the growth in taxable income is not enough to compensate for the effect of the lower tax rate. We'll call this more common occurrence a weak Laffer curve effect. And in a few cases, of course, where tax cuts aren't designed to improve incentives to earn taxable income, there's no revenue feedback at all. And even though I hate talking about higher taxes, it's also worth mentioning that the Laffer curve works in reverse. If politicians increase tax rates, 
especially if they do something really destructive like boosting the top tax rate and punishing entrepreneurs and investors, people will earn and report less taxable income. One of the most classic and tragic examples of the Laffer Curve had nothing to do with income tax rates, though. In 1990, as part of President Bush's surrender of his Read My Lips, No New Taxes promise, he agreed to a so-called luxury tax on yacht purchases. This punitive tax supposedly was going to make rich people pay more tax. But guess what happened? Those rich people bought fewer boats, or at least they bought fewer boats in the U.S., so the IRS collected less money than projected. But that's just the beginning of the story. Lots of boat yards lost business, so they generated less income for the government to tax, and a lot of middle-class workers in those boat yards lost their jobs, meaning not only that they had less income to tax, but also that some of them started relying on government handouts. So it was a lose-lose situation for the budget. Now, disentangling all these different effects is not easy, but it's quite likely that the luxury tax was a net revenue loser for government, a reverse case of the strong Laffer curve effect. On that cheerful note, let's bring this to a close. The final video in this series will get you angry. We're going to discuss in part three the revenue estimating process for tax legislation. You will think I'm exaggerating, but you will learn that revenue estimators assume that tax policy changes, regardless of their magnitude, have no impact on the economy and no meaningful impact on taxable income. Even more disturbing, you will learn how this bizarre approach creates a bias for bad tax policy and higher tax rates. So if you want to get angry, watch part three. I'm Dan Mitchell, and I thank you for giving us some time. As always, please help the Center for Freedom and Prosperity educate America by circulating these videos.